Welcome to this presentation about passive uh, bi-static radar using Spaceborne Sentinel-1 non-cooperative source using a B210 and Raspberry Pi single board computer. This presentation has been prepared by Wei Kefeng and myself. It's a sequel to the presentation we gave at FOSDEM at the beginning of the year in February about uh, processing level 1 data from Sentinel-1 and uh, the sequel at uh, European New Radio Days this summer about uh, processing level 0 raw data. So we are going to complete this endeavor with passive bi-static uh, measurement using the same source. So let's start with a short reminder of what uh, passive bi-static radar is about and uh, why there is a challenge with uh, selecting the source for such applications. So passive radar is based on the idea of using existing uh, emitters, uh, radio frequency emitters, and uh, under the assumption that we are not aware of what this emitter is emitting, it, what kind of information it's sending, uh, we need two channels uh, for recording the information. We need a reference channel for recording this uh, emitter signal and a surveillance channel that will detect any time delayed or Doppler shifted signal from this emitter. Now, this kind of uh, passive bi-static radar is quite popular with uh, university or amateur uh, radar enthusiasts because it prevents from getting the authorization to emit large power over a wide bandwidth. Why does radar require high power at large bandwidth? First of all, because the received power decays as the fourth power of the distance between emitter and receiver in a monostatic approach. So, because this emitter is uh, transmitting towards target which appears itself as a point-like source. We have a 1 over d squared multiplied by 1 over d squared, that's 1 over d to the fourth power. So we do need high power emission and furthermore the range resolution, so the uh, accuracy with which this distance can be estimated is solely dependent on the inverse of the bandwidth. The range resolution is the velocity of flight in the medium divided by twice the bandwidth, twice because it's a two-way trip, and uh, the higher the, uh, uh, the, the bandwidth, uh, uh, the better the resolution. Furthermore, the bin width is uh, defined by, uh, uh, which gives the azimuth resolution, will be determined by antenna size with respect to the wavelength. So the shorter the wavelength or the higher the frequency, the smaller the antenna allowing for a narrow beam width and hence a high uh, azimuth resolution. Nevertheless, most of applications will require extremely large antennas and uh, in order to achieve high uh, uh, azimuth uh, resolution, synthetic aperture radar is based on the idea that that we can move the uh, receiving antennas uh, along a path uh, that will synthesize an equivalent aperture equal to the path length traveled by the antenna as we measure successively the uh, reference signal and the target uh, echoes. Now this technique has been demonstrated using a wide range of sources. Actually I discovered when preparing this presentation that even the sun has been used for passive bi-static radar and this has been demonstrated using a wide range of uh, software defined radio receivers, E312, B210. Uh, these are the references uh, demonstrating these applications. Uh, actually the lowest grade uh, radio frequency such as the Pluto-SDR will not be usable because you do need two coherent channels uh, with the same local oscillator clocking the uh, A to D converter and the same local oscillator uh, performing the frequency transposition from radio frequency band to baseband. So you do need a, a dual channel receiver. Now, many sources have been applied to passive bi-static radar, analog television, digital television, uh, FM broadcast, GSM. Uh, surprisingly, uh, spaceborne uh, radar has hardly been ever applied to this kind of uh, endeavor, and this is uh, the topic of this presentation. Sentinel-1 is a spaceborne radar, uh, actually it's a couple of satellites uh, launched by the European Space Agency, uh, orbiting at an altitude of 693 kilometers, so we'll see that this matters in calculating the parameters and uh, the NORAD the two line element uh, uh, orbital parameter will tell us that the satellites are orbiting uh, nearly 15 times per day so that's uh, 98 uh, minutes uh, per orbit as most low earth orbiting satellites uh, exhibit. Uh, Sentinel-1 emits a peak power of about 5 kilowatt uh, which uh, explains why we selected this uh, source for passive bi-static radar. It's a C-band radar meaning that it's emitting at in the 5 to 7 gigahertz band which is nicely within uh, the capability of the uh, B210 from 
content, the AD9361, uh, and with a bandwidth of 60 megahertz, that's going to be more of a challenge. Uh, this senti this uh, radar is emitting over all land mass in the so-called interferometric wide swath, which is exhibited over here. Interferometric wide means that uh, we're going to have successively three swaths that are uh, uh, swept uh, during the uh, motion of a satellite along its orbit. And as a satellite is sweeping each one of its swaths, we're going to have burst uh, one after the other. So if we have uh, a, a target located somewhere on the surface of the Earth, we will need to know on which swath uh, we are uh, being illuminated with because uh, uh, radar parameters uh, are evolving uh, along this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, illumination scheme. In this example, the uh, motion of a satellite along its uh, orbit will uh, provide the spatial diversity needed for azimuth compression. So the question is, now that we understand uh, the basics of level one processing from the FOSDEM presentation and the uh, radio frequency parameters that are extracted from the telemetry in the level zero data processing, can we uh, use this information for passive bistatic radar measurement? Uh, here are the uh, SNAP, uh, the uh, European Space Agency toolbox for processing the Sentinel-1 data, level 1. You see here uh, interferometric wide 1 and interferometric wide swap 3, uh, 1, 2 and 3. And these are the bursts, so assuming that our target is located with a green star, you see here that we expect to be illuminated uh, with interferometric wide 1 parameters between bursts 2 and 3. And interferometric wide 3 parameters should not uh, allow us to get uh, a clear image because this is not the illumination scheme uh, over our location. So based on this knowledge, uh, we uh, decided to try to collect raw data from Sentinel-1. Initially, we started with a horn antenna. Uh, it's a rather fancy antenna. It's about $1,000. Uh, at the end of the day, you only need a helical antenna, as described in uh, Balani's uh, book. Uh, with these uh, design rules, uh, the circumference is between three-fourths and a four-third of, uh, of the wavelength. And considering that the wavelength is uh, 5.5 centimeters, that defined the, define the circumference and hence the diameter. And uh, additionally, we have the resistance at, uh, at operating frequency, which uh, gives you something about 100 ohm, which is not matched to 50 ohm, but will be working well enough. So this is about 4 centimeter long, a 15 millimeter diameter, a helical antenna over a hollow Teflon core uh, cylinder. Now, the challenge in uh, collecting these data from Sentinel-1 is that the satellite is emitting a 60 megahertz wide uh, bandwidth and our uh, CF-19 laptop only has USB 2 port, which will not allow us to collect such our large data rate. So our interest is to try to uh, use embedded uh, single board computers, namely Raspberry Pi 4 with its um, two USB 3 ports and its 8 gigabyte RAM used as a RAM disk for fast data storage. Now, if you do a quick computation, the B210 is claimed to allow streaming 56 mega samples per second. Uh, and if we uh, reduce the over the wire uh, format to 8 bit uh, per data, that means that uh, uh, by using 6 gigabyte of the 8 gigabyte RAM at 60, 56 mega sample per second IQ, we get a 57 uh, second record. Uh, on the other hand, if we try to collect uh, two channel data, then the B210 is limited to 30 mega samples per second. And again, by limiting the over the wire uh, format to uh, eight bit data, then we get a 53 second record by uh, recording both channels, uh, reference and surveillance. Now Sentinel-1 uh, pass uh, as uh, given by the parameters by heavens above should last nine minutes from horizon to horizon. But due to the illumination scheme that we have just described here, where a given location is illuminated during uh, a single interferometric wide swath and a given burst. Actually, by monitoring uh, a full path uh, emission, we observe that uh, the uh, useful duration is only a couple of seconds, five seconds at most. So out of the nine minutes, we're going to collect only five useful seconds. And due to the uncertainty of synchronizing uh, the recording time, starting the acquisition, stopping the acquisition, we see that 53 seconds give us ample uh, freedom before and after the actual useful uh, record. 
So at the end of the day, we're going to have two uh, helical antennas for broader beam width and uh, we're going to record about uh, 50 seconds worth of data on both channels uh, and then extract each interferometric white. How do we know that each one of these power as a function of time is associated with a given interferometric wide parameter because we learned how to decode level, uh, level zero uh, data from Sentinel-1 and uh, from one pass to another uh, the satellite is using the same parameters and if we analyze the telemetry from level zero and we uh, co convert the huge uh, about a three gigabyte long uh, time domain record into a matrix where we have uh, time, uh, the fast time, and here azimuth, the slow time, uh, with the echo pulse repetition interval, we see that here we have uh, a convergence of a given uh, uh, bright target at the same range for parameter of SWAF1. We see here that this is SWAF2 and here we have two records of SWAF3. So uh, by analyzing the pulse repetition interval, we can identify which uh, data, uh, which burst is associated with uh, SWAF1, SWAF2 or SWAF3. The software is available on this uh, GitHub repository. So based on this knowledge, we might consider that we want to maximize the bandwidth and maximizing the bandwidth means uh, increasing uh, the, the sample rate by using a single channel. And uh, here is an example of collecting 50 uh, mega sample per second for about a minute on a single channel. And because from the level zero parameters and the telemetry, we know the pulse repetition interval, we can align the data. And here is a close up on the a strong target uh, along the correct swath. So by knowing the orbit circumference, uh, we know the, uh, the, the traveled uh, path by the satellite during uh, the period, and this gives us the linear velocity. And what we actually realize is that over the five seconds that this record has lasted, the satellite has traveled 37 kilometers. So what you see here is that this strong target, instead of being at a given same range, is moving uh, from uh, uh, index 20 to index about 25. And this means that azimuth compression, which is a Fourier transform along this direction, as we are going to see later, will not converge because all these data are not in the same range. So this means that you actually do need dual channel record to compensate for the satellite motion along its path during the recording. Now, unfortunately, there is no sample uh, uh, software from ATIS Research on using UHD for fast streaming from a dual channel over the wire 8-bit to file. So we get inspiration from the RX multi-samples and we slightly modify the software to uh, the targeted uh, objective. So this is just a quick uh, illustration of what the software looks like running on the Raspberry Pi. Um, we start by setting our parameters all we did actually was uh, double all parameters to go for channel 1 and channel 2. Frequency is 5.4 gigahertz. Uh, the data rate is 30 megahertz for both channels, of course, and the gain is the same for both channels at gain of 70 dB. We set all the parameters for both channels 0 and 1. That's uh, only copy pasting. And once we've done this, uh, we need to configure both channels to uh, stream continuously the data and uh, we will loop until we get uh, all the data. Now the novelty is writing data as 8-bit uh, data. Uh, the default configuration of the software is 16-bit or float, which means twice or four times uh, the same amount of uh, file size and uh, that means uh, shrinking the duration of the acquisition. So storing the data as uh, unsigned 8-bit uh, characters is mandatory for large uh, data. Uh, collection. So I'll let you go through the details of running this software. So finally, what we might be interested in is knowing with sub-minute accuracy when will be the acquisition. If we take one of the level zero data set, whether the raw data set over the interferometric wide single looks complex data from the European Space Agency Copernicus website, we see that the naming convention is Sentinel-1, interferometric wide, raw or single look complex. And what we have here is the date, 2021, uh, May 19th, and this is the UTC hour, 17 hours, 23 minutes, 56 seconds, until um, 
17 hours, 24 minutes, 29 seconds. So we see here that the duration of a pass, the duration of the illumination of one of these data sets uh, that illuminated our location as stored on the Copernicus website lasts about 30 seconds from 23.56 to 24.29. So this 33 second duration is well within the duration of our record of remember 55 seconds and even if we miss by a couple of seconds in the beginning or in the end we will still collect the, uh, the proper uh, data. Finally, we might wonder where is actually the satellite located as it is illuminating a given location. This is our location in Besançon, east of France, next to the Swiss border. And because Sentinel-1 is illuminating right-handed at around 45 degrees, this means that actually, since Sentinel-1 is flying in an orbit of 700 km high, it's about 700 km to the west. And because France is about 800 km wide, this means that the satellite is actually flying over the, the Atlantic Ocean here uh, on the west west of France as it is illuminating Besançon at a 45 degree angle. So actually this is uh, the, uh, the flight path uh, 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 plotted by the ground track generator that uh, feeds uh, the uh, two-line element and uh, knowing the, the date at which the track has to be, to be displayed, this will generate uh, a shape file that you can import in uh, QGIS for projecting where the satellite is located. So with all this knowledge, uh, we put on our balcony a reference channel. Here we put the helical antenna on the uh, 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 facing west uh, uh, on an ascending pass. This is the horn antenna facing east. The idea was to have a maximum gain towards the uh, echoes of the targets. And this means that because this is quite a narrow beam antenna, we will only see uh, reflections on a rather narrow beam around 16 degrees. Here we have a roll time record. This is the reference channel and the surveillance channel uh, and you see here that out of uh, 33 seconds that we recorded only about five seconds are actually useful and of these five seconds uh, about one second interferometric white free has been used to perform the uh, processing so you nicely see some features that are actually reminiscent of the topography here we have uh, the Besançon city at the uh, front and on the background here we have some of the mountains and these are uh, nicely uh, correlated with the Topograph topographic features. Actually, the trick is that the range here is not the range as if the satellite was flying at the level of the Earth, but the range uh, needs to account for the angle of illumination, in this case, around 45 degrees. We're going to see a bit more details, and if you want to see some scientific endeavor on this uh, topic, you might uh, want to have a look at this uh, uh, Romanian and German paper where they actually use Sentinel-1 to, uh, to do this kind of bistatic uh, measurement. Here you've got the ra Raspberry Pi 4 collecting the data from the B210 and uh, actually there is a, a 15 meter long cable between my balcony and the other side of the building. This is facing east, this is facing west, so I have to go uh, all the way through my apartment, through the hall and to the other side of the staircase and uh, doing this at 5.4 gigahertz if you just take some uh, cheap RG58 uh, coaxial cable that's not going to work, that's more than 30 dB loss for the 15 meter long cable, so make sure that you use some high quality like LMR400 uh, cable which exhibit less than 60 dB loss at 5.4 uh, gigahertz. Uh, you might actually wonder why we use the helical antenna as a reference and the uh, uh, horn as the, uh, as the surveillance uh, that was to maximize the gain on, on the target and actually that was a poor selection because we want to maximize the beam width towards the target and actually we want to maximize the signal quality of the reference uh, channel that will define our correlation capability and uh, although this horn antenna is 16 degree wide if you do a quick calculation that the satellite is flying about 7.5 km per second and for a duration of 5 seconds, that means that at a range of 980 kilometers, uh, it will cover an angle of 2.2.2 uh, degrees, which is much less than the beam width of uh, these uh, horn antennas. So actually facing the horn antenna towards the reference and the helical antenna towards the target would make more sense and this is what we're going to do in the next presentations. Now here is another example that was taken not from my balcony but uh, from a hill 
also in Besançon, uh, that was a different location uh, in front of, of this uh, sharp uh, cliff here. And uh, the beauty of this whole analysis is that you don't need to accurately know uh, the satellite position, as was the case in the previous reference that we cited. In this particular case, all we need to know is the duration of the acquisition and the geometry uh, at how quickly the uh, satellite is moving along its orbit. And that's the only assumption that we're going to make. And again, you see here that this cliff on the, s on the front is uh, nicely visible on this uh, uh, map of the targets, which is overlaid on the RL imager from Google Earth. Uh, we see here some of the other features as of the surrounding of Besançon. This is another cliff. Uh, and these are uh, also hills uh, that act as reflectors uh, on the uh, uh, on the surroundings. So actually, the topography will be the main factor defining the uh, reflection capability of this environment. Now, uh, you might wonder how we actually get these images. And uh, what I wanted to show here is that in the range direction, getting the uh, distance to the uh, target is uh, a correlation along the time domain where we uh, have uh, the reference uh, channel correlated with the surveillance channel and the inverse uh, of uh, bandwidth gives the range resolution. Now, how do we do along the uh, azimuth uh, compression, meaning how do we get the location along the path of the satellite? What I want to show here is that it's a simple matter of inverse Fourier transform. Uh, actually, it's not completely obvious and Wake did all the calculation. Uh, the model is actually a bit different because usually when we do by static radar, we have actually a static emitter and a nearby moving receiver, or we have both emitter and receiver moving along a line. In this case, we're under a different assumption because we have this infinitely far away source that is moving along its orbit, uh, and we have these two static receivers, reference and surveillance channel, assuming that we have a target uh, at coordinate x and y. What are the properties that will allow us to recover uh, from this geometry, the position of the uh, target. Now, it is well known that uh, usually when you want to do a correlation, you don't do this in the time domain, but you do this in the frequency domain, because based on the convolution theorem, the correlation is uh, nearly uh, identical to a uh, convolution, except that time is swapped on one of the terms, and swapping time is a complex conjugate. So that means that the correlation between two signals, reference and surveillance, is the Fourier transform of reference times a complex conjugate, that's a time swap of a surveillance signal, inverse Fourier transform to get back to the time. So this is just if you were to process along the, the range. And if you want to also do azimuth compression, if you look at this uh, excellent uh, tutorial about synthetic aperture radar, you will uh, figure out that uh, because a signal looks like exponential of j to pi, uh, your uh, wave vector times the, the, the uh, direct uh, information, in this case, the range, uh, then the Fourier transform of this uh, expression is a Dirac at x and y. So if you can express your signal recorded by the uh, radar is a product of two exponential j to pi uh, k the dual quantity times x the real uh, quantity then you can uh, separate uh, the uh, azimuth and range and you can recover the position of your target so the question is based on the data that we recorded which is uh, the satellite flying along its path with the time domain information of the range and uh, the uh, surveillance and reference uh, channels can we recover the position of a satellite so uh, what wake teaches us is that uh, we express uh, the uh, uh, phase introduced uh, by the uh, surveillance channel uh, bouncing on the uh, ch uh, target and getting uh, back to the surveillance channel with respect to the phase introduced by the reference channel. So if we look uh, at the satellite to a receiver range R1, that's this guy over here, it's uh, x s squared plus y squ uh, s squared, which x satellite and y satellite is the position of a satellite. And you can do a Taylor series development by considering that because the range y is much bigger than x, if you actually do the calculation, uh, the pulse repetition interval is about uh, 1.6 kilohertz and the satellite is moving at 7 kilometers per second. That means that every new pulse is separated by about 4.7 meters from the previous one. On the other hand, this range is 900 kilometers. So you can consider that the distance is much bigger than X and you can do a Taylor series 
where this square root of u squared plus v squared is about v plus u squared over 2v. So you apply this also to the uh, satellite target and uh, actually the target to uh, receiver, you cannot do any uh, assumption because this distance might be uh, not known and actually might be quite short. So we're going to call this, uh, this uh, distance uh, are uh, free here is the range, your usual range, that's your uh, range over here. And uh, this other direction here, this azimuth direction, will be extracted by uh, performing the phase calculation. So the phase can be either computed, considered as 2 pi f tau, the tau, tau the time delay at frequency f, or 2 pi uh, the range uh, trend, uh, uh, traveled by the wave divided by the wavelength. And if you do this calculation over here, I will let, look, uh, let you go through the details of the calculation. You actually end up separating the two quantities. You get 2 pi f, something like R3, which is the range, and you get something about xs and x, which is independent on uh, the uh, range and which is only dependent on the azimuth and which will give you the azimuth resolution. So actually, because we're able to separate range and azimuth through this Taylor series, it means that by taking a 2D Fourier transform, we can separate range and azimuth and get these 2D maps, uh, such as this one. This one was collected over Paris, so here we're located uh, at Mont Valérien, which is a, a nice lookout over uh, the Paris uh, area. Uh, of course, located on the west side because the satellite is flying on the west, is illuminating towards the east, and we want to have reflections from the targets. Uh, we have here business district of La Défense, we have uh, the Eiffel Tower here, and we have uh, in front the uh, Bois de Boulogne, and all these features are detected at a range of about four kilometers using our bi-static uh, uh, radar measurement. So this is overlaid over an aerial picture of Paris, and if we just uh, remove the transparency, you see nicely here these long straight roads that are well known to crisscross uh, Bois de Boulogne. Here you have the uh, 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 business district of uh, La Défense. And initially, we were a bit disappointed not to see uh, the Eiffel Tower because this is a huge mass of metal right in the center of Paris, and we expected to see this as a reflection. Nevertheless, we did have a, a reflection, actually a triangular-shaped reflection, a bit closer to uh, the expected range. And actually, and uh, by analyzing a bit closer, what happens is uh, the Eiffel Tower is quite high, about, about 320 meter high, and this means that the incoming electromagnetic wave hits the top of the tower before it reaches the bottom and actually your uh, structure here is going to be elongated in this direction. So this means that what you see here is the top of a tower, uh, not actually a 320 meter, but this is dependent also, you can look at the geometry here, uh, it's dependent on, on the uh, tangent of the illumination angle, so that's going to be about 400 meter, and actually the top of a tower is indeed about 400 meter closer to the expected geometric location of this target. So this is a so-called layover effect, which is well documented in this uh, publication by uh, European Space Agency, so it's really nice to see this experimentally. So to conclude this presentation, we described a low-cost educational opportunity for passive bi-static radar measurement using a moving source. The hardware requires a B210, it's about $1,000, a Raspberry Pi 4, and a couple of homemade antenna, helical antennas. We demonstrated how you can uh, address real-life implementation of complex processing algorithm by uh, uh, demonstrating a range in azimuth compression, and uh, actually you would get a bit uh, further to show you how this uh, uh, plane between the uh, satellite orbit and the uh, receiver uh, will be projected on the ground plane that's a bit more involved. I am running out of time to describe this in detail, but actually at the end there is no degree of freedom over the rotation and all scales are determined by the parameters. This is another demonstration of using the handheld instrument, portable instrument uh, in Clermont-Ferrand, uh, located near the, near the Volcano, center of France. Uh, all demonstration and software can be downloaded loaded at uh, GitHub on the Sentinel-1 PBR uh, repository and perspective. Our, in all these demonstrations, you see that we're looking for elevated location to see the illumination from above. Uh, this is actually lightweight enough to be uh, carried by a UAV, so it would be nice to uh, fly the UAV for a few seconds that the recording is going to last. The Raspberry Pi and this antenna will be lightweight enough to be carried. Furthermore, we might consider inter interferometric synthetic aperture radar 
are by comparing successive passes under the assumption that the satellite is close enough from one orbit to another for the uh, phase subtraction to make sense. Actually, this topic field of application is probably going to widen if we look at this uh, shifting ground publication from Science in 2021. We are told that the number of civilian and commercial synthetic aperture satellites in orbit has more than doubled, and a dozen more are set to launch this year, which would bring the number of spaceborne satellites to more than 60. So enjoy and have fun with passive bisatic radar using spaceborne radar systems. Thank you for your attention.